Hi, and welcome to our virtual theater talk for the reading of I Got a Home by Shirley Graham Du Bois, directed by Steve H. Brodnick III. This reading is a part of the Refocus Project at Roundabout Theater Company. My name is Nafisa Monroe, and I'm a teaching artist with Roundabout, and I am zooming in with you from the traditional and current lands of the Lenape people. Hi, I'm Leah Reddy. I'm also a teaching artist with Roundabout Theater Company, and I'm also zooming in to you from the lands of the Lenape people. Awesome. Hey, Leah. Hey, Nafisa. I'm so excited to talk about Shirley Graham Du Bois. She's so fascinating. Why, why, why is she not like in my regular history class? I don't understand. I think I got, I got a few guesses. Let's see if we can uh, get far enough into her biography to explain it to our audience. <laughs> okay. I mean, let's be honest. We could talk about her for hours. We could. We would try so to keep this to 15 minutes though. Okay. We have 15 minutes. I'm ready. Let's do it. Okay. So Shirley Graham Du Bois is born Lola Shirley Graham on the 11th of November, 1896 in Indianapolis, Indiana. She is one of five children and she is the only girl. Her father is a African Methodist Episcopal preacher. So she grows up very much in the church. When she is a very young child, her father is in charge of really prominent congregations in Indianapolis, Detroit, and Chicago. So the family is doing pretty well financially. But then her father runs afoul of a bishop. Uh, apparently, the bishop was a bit drunken. And her brother later described what the bishop did as like some sort of rascality that the father called him out on. OK, can I just interrupt? Can we just bring that word back into use, please? Rascality. rascality. Yes. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about this rascality. What was going on? I think the bishop was drunk and corrupt. Um, but I think that's beside the point because what happened was her dad called him out and her father was subsequently assigned to poor parishes in southern towns. So throughout her childhood, Shirley, as she goes by, is moving around the United States. And there's a couple of things that are consistent in her life. First of all, her father. I think she's very much a daddy's girl is is from what I can read of her biography, what I read of her biography, which was the biography, she was very close to her father. Um, mm -hmm. He would read to her. One of his favorite passages was the beginning of the book of John and the beginning was the word and the word was God. In her mind, she connected that to his love of reading, his love of reading to her and her eventual love of words and reading. Mm -hmm. He was also a very generous man. She describes him giving away a coat which is something that we're going to see in I Got a Home, comes back in. This, this character very much influences. Yeah. Um, it's, is that a spoiler? Uh-oh. I don't think it's a spoiler. Okay, good. Very generous <laughs> reverend. Mm -hmm. Don't feel spoiled for the play. Um, okay. She also is exposed to church music. She's very involved in music. One of his churches in Tennessee gets an organ, and she's not tall enough to play it, but she tries to figure it out and like rig it up for herself anyway. She graduates as valedictorian of her junior high school class in Clarksville, Tennessee. But by high school, she is out in Spokane, Washington, where she was apparently one of the few Black students in the area. As far as I understand it, it was not a huge destination for Black Americans or African Americans at the time. Yeah, we weren't really welcome there at that time, definitely. And then right out of high school, she chose to go to business school, right. which is not like a very, it wasn't a very usual thing at the time, which is just, she's just so fascinating to me. And then she was married shortly thereafter and had two sons and then divorced. I don't know much about the divorce. I wasn't able to find any information about the divorce, but what I love about after her divorce is that she chose to go study music in France at the Sorbonne mm -hmm. in Paris. And then what did her children do while she was there? So it's, it's interesting. She actually left her sons who were very young at the time. They would have been toddlers with her parents mm. and sort of broke out of this mold of being a housewife, even a fairly educated housewife in a fairly stable situation just wasn't for her. I don't think that her ambition could be contained in being a housewife in the Pacific Northwest and raising her sons. She wanted to do more and see more and know more. Yeah. Uh, and well, she also wanted to support her kids. I was going to say, like, not only to support her kids, but also to, you know, it's like if you limit yourself as a parent, you're not really giving your your children the opportunity to see how grand a human being they can be. Right. Mm -hmm. Like you have to go be your biggest self so that you are also being a model for that as well. Yeah. 
one of the things I think that's really significant about her time at the Sorbonne was she met a lot of Africans and that was where she was really introduced to um, African music and maybe started to be where she started to love a lot of the African rhythms and examine who she was as the as a as a member of African diaspora, right? Mm -hmm. um, when she got back to the States, she studied at Howard. And I know you found some sources that said she also did some studying at Columbia University as well. She was, you know, seeking information and education. And that's like just I I I I really get the sense of this thirst for knowledge that she had, right? In the early 30s, she headed the music department of Morgan State College. Shortly thereafter, she decided that she wanted to go study and get her bachelor's and her master's degree at Oberlin in Ohio. And I think that that's, again, speaks to her recognizing that the degrees would give her opportunities for jobs that would give her more opportunity to, to be able to care for her family in the way she wanted to care for them. And in her second year at Oberlin, she wrote something fantastic that I know you really love. So I'm gonna hand it to you to chat about what she wrote while she was there. So she worked on at Oberlin, also she'd actually piloted it back at Morgan State, an opera, a full length opera called Tom Tom. Mm -hmm. And it's very, very ambitious in its scope. It's three acts. First act mm -hmm. takes place in Africa, introduces three archetypal characters, uses tons and tons of West African rhythms, particularly the tom-tom, a drum. There's percussion that runs through it. Second act takes place um, in the United States during slavery. That brings in a lot of the spirituals that she grew up with, a lot of the church music. And then third act takes place in Harlem in the 1930s. So contemporary, we're having those same archetypal characters and we're adding into that, not only is there the African sound, the spirituals, by jazz and some of the more modern music. So she's really worked in all of this different musical styles culminating in a giant, massive, epic three act opera. Now, do you wanna talk a little bit about the production of it and then I'll pop in with my fun facts? Yeah, I was gonna say, like, I know you have some fun facts about it. The source I read said that it was produced and was performed in front of 25,000 people, that it sold, it was, the, it was part of a big festival and it sold all the seats. Um, it also aired on NBC radio. It was the first and unfortunately last production of this opera. So it's time for a remount, I think. Um, <clears throat> It was also the first all black opera to be professionally produced in the United States uh, that we know of. Ms. Graham was the first black woman to write and stage an all black opera. So tell me about the staging of this opera because I'm super excited to know about it. So yes, um, this opera had a chorus of a thousand that she personally directed. The opera also involved a 30-foot waterfall on stage built for her by the Cleveland Fire Department yeah. and also an elephant. <gasps> I'm saying, Broadway, we need it. We need it. We need the 30-foot waterfall. waterfall. We need the elephant, like thousand-person cast. Let's do it. Let's yeah. just, we could just bring all of opera, all of Broadway to one house. I think one, could... like a big coliseum in Cleveland. Absolutely. I think what is so interesting about this on so many levels is that for there never having been an opera staged by a black woman in the United States before, for it to get this kind of support and resources and money shows how incredible it was. Yeah. It was sort of posited as, in her words, connecting and reconnecting black Americans with the West African aspect of their history and making this one big epic out of Black American life on some level, which I think is a really interesting comment on how she was starting to see herself and see her place in, um, in the world. And also she was, you mentioned that she wanted to get an education in order to be able to provide for her family. I think she actually went a little further. She wanted to be an authority. She wanted to be respected. She wanted the power. It's very clear that she wanted the power and the money to do the kind of work she wanted to do and to make the changes she wanted to make in society. That's yeah. a, a clear line for me that runs through everything she writes and says and does. Yeah, she she's definitely, constantly reinventing. Absolutely. She definitely was witnessed 
different levels of equality and different levels of poverty and the divide between classes. I mean, across the country in, you know, in the 20s, right? Mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine what she witnessed as a young person. And mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I also agree that like everything you see in her life, she was fighting for this racial equality, for um, for fairness, for fairness in legislation and politics, for representation, for being seen, mm -hmm. right? Being seen and heard, definitely. One thing that's interesting about Tom Tom that I also read is that there are a couple scholars who argue that that was uh, an inspiration for a lot of Africanisms that started to show up in different productions, including the Macbeth that was directed for, for the Federal Theater Project. So when she graduated from Oberlin with her bachelor's and her master's, her thesis was titled The Survival of Africanism in Modern Music. And that, like you said, I think starts to become this connection to Africa, starts to become kind of a theme in her life, but also a connection to original uh, Africa, like what the continent was originally pre-colonialism and what, what colonialism was doing to that and to the people of the African diaspora here in the United States. In 1936, right after she graduates, she's invited to take over the Chicago Negro unit of the Federal Theater Project. And for those of you that aren't quite familiar, the Federal Theater Project was a program that President Roosevelt started just towards the end of the Depression to help get theater artists back to work. And of the Federal Theater Project, there were 23, I believe, Negro units that were opened across the country that were specific for Negro theater artists or for Black American theater artists, as we would call them now. So in Chicago in 1936, Ms. Graham takes over that one and it is flailing. It is not doing well. And in two years, she turns it from a flailing theater company into a nationally recognized theater company with her achievements. So listen to the things that she did. While she was being a theater administrator, she also designed, wrote, composed the plays and musicals and, and directed as well. All that she was able to achieve for the Federal Theater Project in Chicago was recognized by someone at Yale University, and she was actually awarded a Rosenwald Fellowship in Creative Writing, and that is where she began, began being a playwright. And while she was at Yale for the next two years, she wrote three plays and one radio comedy, and one of those plays is I Got a Home that we're about to do the reading of. So I Got a Home was actually based on a play she wrote in 1930 called Elijah's Ravens. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a rewrite uh, without any spoilers. It is a mix of melodrama, realism, and light comedy. And when you look at who she's writing for, what she's writing, she's clearly writing for the mass market. Um, she knows that as a Black woman, she can't produce hard-hitting realism, perhaps, in the way that other playwrights can and expect it to get picked up for production and expect it to sell. So she turns to a more lighter bit of fair, but she works in a lot of her own beliefs and the way she sees things and a little bit of social commentary into the play anyway. I was reading um, an article about Shirley Graham, Lillian Hellman, and realism at the time, and they compare what she's doing to the show The Guiding Light, which was a radio soap opera at the time, oh, yeah. which was about a white pastor's family. They kind of said, you know, in a lot of ways, Shirley Graham flips that idea and writes about a Black pastor's family and puts in her own social consciousness into the piece as well. And oh. also, it's very, you know, it's very, very tied to her childhood, right? There's a lot of stuff about the large family living in a parsonage, yep. people who, you know, getting ready to pack up and move if they have to, right? How much they actually are allowed to live there versus how much belongs to the church and the community and... Mm -hmm. uh, and she really engages in this, in a different view, I think, at the time of what it was like to be a part of the Black community here. And like you said, there's the the, the lightheartedness of it. There's, there's a lot of joy in this play. And I was actually so pleasantly surprised. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, in some ways it is very much a, of its time. And in some ways it goes against. So she's waiting for a mass market. She knows what's going to sell. It mm -hmm. definitely has feelings of you can't take it with you to me big family, sort of a batty patriarch, solving the family's problems with more people. And then the sister comes, right? The sister and then the sister mom. comes, um, which gave me a little bit of like shades of meet Vera Stark, actually, which I oh, also wow. found that she sort of predated that by so much. But anyway, it was successful. 
It was picked up by the Gilpin Players, which were in Cleveland, Ohio, and it was performed at Case Western Reserve University. And uh, the reviews were quite good, especially of uh, the woman who played the sister, an uh, actress named Minnie Gentry. Mm. I just want to add here that the Gil- this was the original Gilpin Players mm-hmm. in Cleveland, Ohio, not to be confused with the current Gilpin Players, which is uh, exists in another state right now. But uh, the Gilpin Players now, they still exist, but they're known as the Karamu Players. They changed their name, I think, in the 40s, actually. Oh. So that was sort of the story of I Got a Home. Her other plays, some of them dabbled more in realism, particularly one called Coal Dust, which was based on the story of a Black miner strike. And that was also produced by Gilpin Players, Mm -hmm. now known as Caramu Players. Yeah, definitely. I mean, she's she's fascinating. Should we talk a little bit about her legacy? Like I said, we could go on hours and hours. So let's we should probably give you a little bit to, to go home with. So. So in the 40s, one thing that she also started to do was to write biographies. And by the time she passed away, actually, she had written about 11 biographies. And um, the third one was the one that really started to bring up her her prominence as a writer and also increase her financial stores. Um, The third one was the biography of Frederick Douglass. I just don't want to get messed up the title, so I'm going to read it here. It's, it's called There Was Once a Slave, dot, 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 The Heroic Story of Frederick Douglass. Mm-hmm. And that one, actually, before it was even published, it won the best book combating intolerance in America in 1947. And it's just really started to shift things for her. She was able to buy a house. She won a Guggenheim Fellowship. She was able to take some of that money and travel to Europe. And in Europe, she had already started to get a name. So she was invited to stay with people and was mixing uh, in in the artistic and also in the um, some of the like the movers and shakers of the of the time. She was mixing in all that company. She spent a lot of time getting to know W.E.B. Du Bois, who she had known since she was a younger person, but they really kind of started to get to know each other more so in these later years in the 40s. One of the things that I think is really fantastic on this trip, that this last most recent trip that I was speaking of that she did to Europe, was she visited Denmark and she actually was able to see Hamlet performed in the original Elsinore castle. Like, that just to me is <laughs> very <laughs> cool. That's very cool. <laughs> so cool. Um, anyways, 1951, she marries a man, 40 years her senior, but with whom she is an intellectual match. And that was W.E.B. Du Bois. In the 50s, because they were red baited or, you know, considered to be red or kind of pinned as leftist or too, too, uh, too political towards equality, whatever the case was, the State Department actually d- different times in the next 10 years would hold on to their passports. So their travels were limited depending on the particular year at that time. And then in 1961, W.E.B. Du Bois gets invited by the then president of Ghana, President Nkrumah, to come to Ghana and finish Encyclopedia Africana, which was meant to be W.E.B. Du Bois's kind of life's work, if that may, if that, I don't know if that's even a big enough word for it. Um, while there in 1963, W.E.B. unfortunately passes away. But Shirley Graham Du Bois stays and she is working with the president of Ghana to help develop the country. They are working towards anti-colonialism. That's the only way I know how to put it. However, in 1966, President Nkrumah is ousted and Shirley Graham Du Bois also has to leave Ghana. After what happened in Ghana, Ms. Graham Du Bois made a choice to start really raising her voice for this concept of pan-Africanism and for finding ways to to work for African countries to work their way out of the effects of colonialism. Mm -hmm. And by the time she got back to the States, she actually became known as the mother of pan-Africanism. She passed away in 1977 in China. Apparently she was there working on a friendship project again Still, she was 80 years old and still fighting for everything she believed in. Kwame Ture, known to some as Stokely Carmichael, wrote to Shirley Graham Du Bois' son after she passed away. And this is what he wrote. Quote, your mother has etched her work into life's history, leaving that indelible mark. Centuries from now, she will be researched. 
A great woman becomes even greater after her death, and the longer she is dead, the greater she becomes. Your mother is already assured of this. When one speaks of Pan-Africanism, she will be there. Of Nkrumah's early model in Ghana, she will be there. Of the struggle in the States, she will be there. Of authors who wrote for history, she is already in all of these and much, much more. She will be a cross-reference of struggle. I think that's a great way to put it, a cross-reference of struggle. Yeah. Yeah, that's where she is. So thank you for joining us for this theater talk. We hope you enjoy the reading of I Got a Home by Shirley Graham Du Bois, directed by Steve H. Prodnax III. And we hope to see you live and in person back in the theater soon.